But, uh, but this is the, the kind of the question that we've got today is, is how do we know that anything is true? What is the means by which we validate something? All right, how, how do I uh, prove something is true? Uh, because oftentimes we want to uh, believe things that are convenient for us, right? I want things to be true that I would like to be true, but that's not how reality works for us, right? Sometimes we can logically build uh, truth or discover truth through things that we are already confident in. That's how mathematics is discovered. I used to be a math teacher. That's what I, I used to be way into, still am, right? Uh, but how do I know anything is true? And that's one of the things that we're going to see uh, in the book of Acts today as we're following the adventures of, of Paul and Silas who have been traveling from town to town and leaving behind them a, a wake of freedom in Jesus where, where villages and towns are being set free because of the gospel, right? Because of, of being, having their sin forgiven, the good news of Jesus is being shared with them, that he has made a way possible for them to be redeemed and set free and and. He's also getting chased out of these towns by people who aren't too excited about that message, right? Dan Kehoe uh, fortunately preached last week for me. I was able to teach Sunday school, which I was happy to do. And, and uh, yeah, he covered what happened in Thessalonica. And, and as we left our, our heroes, I guess, so to speak, uh, they were just chased out of that town, all right? So in Acts 17, I'm picking up at verse 10, and it's on page 666 of the Blue Bibles. There's nothing superstitious about that. That's still a holy page of the Bible, okay? So don't worry. So here we go. Acts 17, verse 10, it says, The brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. All right, so they, they get out of this one town. And when they arrived, they went into the Jewish synagogue. So what I first want to point out is, right, they're being persecuted. There are mobs that are chasing these guys or people are upset because of Jesus. They're offended at the gospel, okay? And, uh, and I want to point out that, first of all, Christians are not pursuing persecution, all right? We're not, like, aiming for people to hate us. Uh, we're not hoping to be killed for our faith, but we are willing to be killed for our faith. All right, we are willing, right? I mean, even, even in terms of just everyday life, even if I don't have people actively hating me or chasing me out of town, right? We as believers, we're supposed to die to self. We're, we're not trying to live to our own desires. We're not trying to just pursue what makes us happy. We're not trying to fulfill our, right, sinful nature. Uh, we're dying to ourselves. So, so Christians, we might have people get offended at us sometimes, but in this case, right, it's not like he was looking to be a martyr. He's willing to be a martyr. I, I guess I don't, I don't know if I should spoil what happens, but he does die. Paul's not still here with us, right? He does get martyred at some point. But, but the point is, right, when, when he sees these mobs kind of forming, he's like, hey, I've got to still preach the gospel, and I'm willing to die for Jesus today, but, but let me move to the next town because these people already have heard. Some of them are already believing. We've already started a church. So, so let's see. Then they arrive, and they went into the Jewish synagogue. Now, what I want to point out is it's a good thing that Paul didn't quit preaching the gospel, that he didn't just give up and be like, man, like I keep getting beaten up. I, I, I get rocks thrown at me and, to, and I'm left for dead in all of these towns. Like he didn't just stop and be like, I had a bad experience once when I told someone about Jesus. They weren't happy about it. And then he like, he didn't just give up, right? He kept doing it. And that's a good thing that he did because in this next town, Berea, we'll see that more people are set free by Jesus. So we, likewise, as believers, hopefully, uh, I know it, it can be uh, difficult to go through if, if we tell someone about Jesus and they're mad at us or they're offended at us uh, as a result, but we shouldn't use that. We shouldn't let our emotions kind of take control of the situation where we're like, you know, we're just going to give in to fear or whatever that we would refuse to, to ever do it again. Uh, Paul kept going, and, and this was good for the people who did receive Jesus. Let's see, verse 11. This is interesting. It says, now the Jews uh, were more noble. Now these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness. Now this is a really good thing, right? People were excited when they heard about Jesus. The word here is, right, the word of the gospel, the word about Jesus, the story of Jesus' life and what he did for us. But it's also the word in terms of God's word, the scriptures, okay? And, and these people received it with eagerness. They were, they were pumped. This is a good thing, all right? But I want to point out that it's insufficient 
to only hear the truth and be excited about it. Like, that, that's not enough. That doesn't actually produce change. If, if all we do is when we hear something, we're like, yeah. Like, that, I hope that on Sundays you guys don't leave here and just be like, man, that was awesome. And then, like, and then like nothing happens. You don't, we don't do anything with the truth that we heard, that our, that our hearts are left unchanged, and we're only, like, momentarily, like, we hit a spike of dopamine or something. Like, that's not what we want, right? We, we want there to be actual change that happens. Now, I'm, I'm glad when we receive the Word of God with joy, right? That is a good thing. I hope that we do. But I, I want to point out, sometimes it's, it's when I read the Bible or when I hear a sermon, and it's sometimes when I'm like, I'm not super happy about what I just read or heard. And I'm like, mm, man, ouch, like that hurts. Like, I'm going to go think about this for a little while. And sometimes that produces greater change. It's not just like something's not true only because I'm excited about it. Right? That's not how truth works. That's not how reality uh, works. It's not just like conformed to whatever I wish. You know, like that's, that's not how, I'm sorry, I don't mean to disappoint you guys, but, but here we go. So they received the word with eagerness, and this is a good response. This is a good first step, but we don't want to end there. And there's a danger of only ever receiving something with excitement or only ever pursuing uh, experiences that are emotional. All right, we don't want to use that as kind of our means to, to discover truth or to seek things out. And Jesus, right, he, he actually, sometimes Jesus would tell stories to make a point about God's kingdom or about what God was like uh, or, or to point out like kind of what we are like. He would tell stories that, right, he made up, okay, these, these stories weren't necessarily true, but they made a point. They were parables. They were analogies, so to speak. And, and there's, a, there's a parable that Jesus tells called the parable of the sower, and, or it's sometimes referred to as the four seed parable, because there's four different types of seed. And I'm going to cover two of those today, because they relate to what happens in Berea. All right, that they point out, they, they bring some clarity, some kind of the behind the scenes issues of what's going on in people's hearts, and also what's taking place uh, at least with the strategy of the enemy. We'll talk about him later. So, so this is uh, one of the parables that Jesus says. It's, it, he talks about it in Matthew, uh, Mark, and Luke. I've got it on the back of your bulletins and the bonus content. So it's, it's, it's described three places in the New Testament, three different eyewitness accounts kind of mess, you know, convey this message. And they all have a little bit uh, uh, different, uh, different aspects to it. And so I'm, I'm preaching from both Luke and Mark. No, Luke and Matthew, I, I lied. I'm sorry. I repent. Here we go. So, so this is what, Je I'll summarize what the parable was. Jesus said that this man, this farmer, goes out and he's planting seed, all right? And he's planting like wheat or something, so he's not like individually like doing it. He's, he's scattering seed, right? He's just like throwing it because uh, he's got a lot of it, and, and that's how he's planting his field, probably like wheat or something like that. And, and some of the seed falls along the path that he's walking on, right? This kind of like hard-packed dirt. Some of the seed falls among the rocks or the stony ground where maybe there's a little bit of soil, but not much. It's, you know, there's not enough for there to be depth for roots to form. Some of it falls among these, these weeds. And then the last type of seed falls among good ground where it's going to produce fruit. And so Jesus, uh, his, he, he tells stories like this sometimes and his disciples are like, Jesus, uh, thanks for the sermon. What does that mean? Like, were, was this like farming instruction today? I don't understand. What were we doing today? Uh, why was that good news for this village or anyone? And, and then he does explain to his disciples what the story meant. And this is what he says in Luke 8, 11, I've got it up on the screen. He says, uh, now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God. All right. He's, he says that the seed is the word of God. So the farmer, someone who's scattering seed is like you or I or anyone when we share God's word with someone. When we tell someone about Jesus, when we give them a verse of hope from the Bible in a time of need, right? That, that we, we, get, we convey them to them God's truth, right? So that, that's you or I, any of us could fit in the category of the farmer. The seed is the word of God. And the four places that the seed lands represent four types of responses to God's word, all right? Four types of hearts that God's word lands upon. And that's what, what he's talking about here, okay? So, so I want to point out that, that people's responses to God's word will be different. That not all people's responses will be good or positive. But just like if a farmer, right, if he's like 
planting his crop, and he's like, man, that seed fell on the path. I'm never going to plant seed again. You know, or like that seed fell among the thorns. I guess I'm not even going to plant any more seed for the rest of my life. I'm giving up on farming. Like, no, no, no. Like the farmer plants the seed because he knows that some of it will be his own food for his family later, right? Like you don't just give up because some of the seed won't germinate or some of the seed won't grow and produce crops, right? You, you still plant seed even though some of it won't succeed. Su- su- succeed seed. All right, there we go. I don't know. So anyways... So I want to point out that, that there, there's a couple of these cases that I'll explain from Jesus' message. All right? One is in Matthew 13. He describes the seed that falls among the rocky places. So Matthew 13, 20. I'm not deceiving you by jumping around between Luke and Matthew. You can read it for yourself. Actually, the whole message of the story, this sermon, is see for yourself. Right? So go and read this. See if I'm trying to trick you. Right? Go read Matthew, Mark, and Luke's version of this story and, and find out. But... Uh, This is what he said, the one on whom seed was sown on the rocky places, all right, so where the seed fell on the rocks, this is the man who hears the word, right, the word of God, and immediately receives it with joy. So when when God's word lands on someone's heart and they receive it with joy, that's that Jesus is saying, it's like when, when farmers plant seed and it lands on rocky soil. So this is step one. Step one is hearing the word. That's a good thing. Right? All of us have opportunity to hear the word. This is important, but it's insufficient by itself to produce change. There must be action afterwards right, in order for any change to take place. Right? Jesus would say, like, blessed is the man who hears my word and does it. Right? Or James says, right, don't be hearers only, but doers of the word. Right? We're not supposed to just come in here and be like, yeah, I like just listening to sermons, but I don't do anything with it. That, that's not what we're supposed to do. And, and what's interesting here is this person immediately receives it with joy. This person has an emotional response to hearing God's word, right? That, that we're, we're excited about what we heard. This is, a, this is a good thing so far. And then verse 21, this is what Jesus says. So they receive it with joy, yet he has no firm root in himself, but is only temporary. And when affliction or persecution arises because of the word, he immediately falls away. So what Jesus is saying here is that, like, hey, it's great to be excited about God's truth. It's great to be excited about God's word, right? That, that maybe like those roots go down quick, but there's not enough depth there, right, because of the rocks, right? That, that we're not allowing it to produce real change in our lives. He says that these, these people, they, they don't have any firm root in themselves, right? Where you're, you're excited about God's word, but then you don't do anything with it. Right? And I know like, this is like, oh man, like, everyone's like, is that me? Like, I hope not. Right? Like, right? That's not what I'm saying here. But, but this is the point is that we don't want to only receive God's truth with joy and then do nothing with it. We need to, to place our roots deep down in it. We need to absorb this. We need to right, take time to evaluate it and verify it as true in our lives. We don't want to just be pursuing emotional experiences. We need, we need to find roots for ourselves. And then this is what Jesus said is that, right, they received the word immediately with joy, and then the moment difficulty came because of the word, they immediately fall away. That this person is an emotional person. Like, hey, I like this, therefore I'm, right, excited about this. Or, oh, this is causing me pain. I don't like this anymore, and I'm going to turn away from it right away. Right, that we don't want to just pursue emotional experiences, uh, we don't want to just receive God's word with joy. We, we want to pursue God as a result. We want to pursue relationship with him. And God sometimes does give us emotional experiences. That is an authentic way to experience God. Right? A few months ago, we went through a series where I talked about that we are a spirit. Right? We have a soul and we live in a body. And, and God does interact with us through those, those means. But we don't want to simply be emotionally led. That should not be our only means for evaluating what's true, right? I don't want to just be like, well, I think something's true because I like it, or I think something's true because I get excited about it, or or we don't want to only be pursuing spiritual experiences that that get us pumped or excited, like, oh man, like I was so blessed the other night because I got got a goosebump, right? Or like during the song, like I, I shouted once, like... Like, God blessed me so much. And, like, those are legitimate experiences, but that's not the thing that we pursue, 
We pursue God. We don't pursue kind of emotional feedback, right? We, we don't just evaluate something as true because it maybe brought us to a point of excitement or a point of, of tears, right? We want to believe something that's true, not just believe something that's like convenient or emotionally produces something in us. So, and, and this is the problem if, if, if we're pursuing things that are simply emotional, is what happens when that emotion wears off, right? Are, are we now sure that, like, do, do we doubt the experience that we had, right? Do we now question God? Or this is what Jesus said, what about if the very truth you believe now suddenly makes your life more difficult? What, what if you now start getting persecuted or you have a degree of suffering because of your belief in God's word? Like, if you're emotionally driven, you're like, this isn't worth it to me anymore. Like, this pain is not worth it, and, and we would give up on it. But, but our emotion is not the thing that determines whether or not something is true. All right, so, so, or what, so what happens if our newfound belief produces this, this suffering or this pain? Are we still going to cling to it as true? Because, I mean, if we look at Paul's life, right, he's been significantly persecuted because of his belief in Jesus. He eventually gets killed for it, but he didn't just like be like, well, this isn't really, uh, this isn't my thing anymore, Jesus. I'm good. Like, I liked it when you were just telling me about like, you know, the, the blessings that you had for me or the forgiveness that you had for me or the love that you had for me, but, but this is a little harder than I wanted to, you know, sign up for. This is what I was looking for. So, so this is what we, what we see in Berea, the Bereans, this church that Paul and Silas are preaching to. They receive the word with eagerness, but they go beyond that, fortunately, right? They, they go beyond that, and this is what I want to encourage for us. So back in verse 11 in Acts, verse seven, or chapter 17, verse 11, it says, now these Jews uh, were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, and then what did they do? They were examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. So they took a response, right? They didn't even choose to believe Paul for the, for the sake of Paul saying it, right? They, they were hearing about Jesus for the first time and they were like, this whole idea of forgiveness and relationship with God sounded very appealing to them, but they, they wouldn't even believe that just on the basis of what Paul was saying or just on the fact that they wanted that to be true. I mean, we all want to be forgiven of our sin. Like, that's awesome. But, but are we believing it only because we want that to be true? Or is it actually true? And that's what they had to determine for themselves. They weren't just going to like, you know, they're not just like listening to any passerby that comes into their town and just says, oh, this is true. And I'm like, oh, well, we'll just believe whatever this guy says. No, no, they, they needed to prove it for themselves. They examined the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. And that's what I want to encourage you guys. Don't just believe something because maybe you've heard a preacher say it, including myself, all right? right? Don't, don't just believe something because like, well, no, I, I, I heard so-and-so say this and, and I kind of like the sound of that, so it's gotta be true. Like, no, 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 evaluate it based on God's word. Don't just believe something because you want it to be true. Like if you hear a preacher say something, you're like, I really liked what they said. Like, you should probably go and find out, like check your heart, like am I liking that because my sin nature likes that a lot? Am I liking that because that, that preacher is, you know, accounting, you know, and, and making my sin acceptable? You know, that they're not, they're not calling me to a point of repentance? It, 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 what part of me is liking this right now? Because I need to find out if this is actually true or not. Or likewise, if you hear a preacher say something that we don't like, that our initial response is like, Ur. we need to evaluate that whether or not it's true by God's word, not based on who said it but based on whether or not God said it. Right? That's, that's what we want. We want to believe things that are true, not just convenient or easy. Uh, is, is that's what the Bereans did, and that's what I hope, I hope that we do as well. So, so these people refused to believe even the gospel unless God had already validated it, right? Because Jesus was this new idea in a lot of people's minds, right? These were, many of them were Jewish. Some of them were, were Greek that came to believe in Jesus that day. But, but they wanted to be like, okay, so you're telling me that this Messiah, this Savior came to die for me to forgive me of all my sin? Like, that sounds awful nice, but is that actually true? And they went and studied the scriptures, 
right? And for them, that meant the Old Testament, right? They went and studied the Old Testament. What's cool about that, one of the reasons we here believe that the Bible is true is because God has something called prophecy, right? The Bible was written by 40 different authors over 1,500 years, and, and he would write, have them write things down before they happened by hundreds of years, Okay, and, and that's what God claims that he alone can do is that he knows the end from the beginning, right? So that's one of the reasons we believe the Bible is true, that it's different than other books is because it predicted things would happen and then they happened, right? That there, there was historical observation of those events happening hundreds of years after they were predicted, right? And so that's what these guys were able to do. They were like, okay, he's saying that there was a Messiah that was supposed to suffer and die and take my sins upon him. And they could go to the Old Testament and see exactly what the prophets had already written about Jesus hundreds of years before he was born, right? So that's, that's how they were able to be convinced that it was true. So, so you and I should likewise put time in with God's word, all right? That, that, now understand, like, not all of us are into, like, uh, theology and philosophy and logic, but we should at least be familiar with God's word so that we're not going to be deceived because the Bible frequently tells us there will be false teachers and frequently tells us do not be deceived, right? We want to be able to tell, it, hey, hey, whoa, whoa, that's, that doesn't sound quite right. Like, biblically, I don't think that quite fits in, right? So, so even me, you evaluate what I say appeared by God's word, not just because I say it's true, right? So let's see verse 12 in Acts. So as a result of their receiving it with eagerness and studying, it says, many of them therefore believed, with not a few Greek women of high standing as well as men. So their belief happened as a result of examining the scriptures for themselves, right? There were both Jewish people and Greek people that came to believe in Jesus that day because they examined the scripture for themselves. They wanted to see for themselves, is this true? They didn't just believe it because Paul said it. And that's what you and I need to do as well. Like, we need to seek things out. We need to determine whether or not this is true, right? Because otherwise, like, you know, this idea of God or salvation, like, it's just like hopeful thinking. Like, it's not like a cross your fingers and hope sort of thing. Like, it's, it's, it's something that we can be certain of. It's something that we can rely upon. And that's, that's what I would encourage for you as well. And, and as a result of their own personal experience with God, with Jesus, with the scriptures, many of them believed. And that's what I want for you guys, right? So, so if you are a skeptic, evaluate it for yourself, right? If this is the first time you've maybe heard about this whole idea of Jesus, evaluate him for yourself, right? Figure out what's going on here. Is this actually true? So, so Jesus once, uh, in John chapter four, he once shared with this lady, this Samaritan woman, and there's a similar experience to this. I'm just going to summarize the story in John chapter 4. And, and he, he like has a conversation with her. And through that conversation, she's like, wait, I think you're a prophet. And she's like, no, you're the Messiah. Like she, she figures out who he is. Like he's dropping hints and like, you know, she figures it out. And as a result of her conversation with Jesus, she runs back to her hometown and tells everyone I found the Messiah, the, you know, the one that, you know, the Old Testament prophesied, like, you guys got to come see this person right now. He's, he's getting water at that well. Come, come over here now, right? She tells her whole town. And, and this is how her, her town responds, John chapter 4, verse 39. It says, many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. All right, she said, he told me all that I ever did. Jesus had a word of knowledge from the Holy Spirit that he was able to just tell her all about her life having just met her that day. And she's like, like, I perceive you're a prophet is what she said. Like, so, so she had this encounter with Jesus and like, all right, this guy's different than just any person I've ever met at this well before. Verse 40, so when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them and he stayed there two days. Verse 41, and many more believed because of his word. And they said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe. All right, it's no longer because of your story, your testimony that we believe, right? For we have heard for ourselves. And we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. 
So this is what I want for you guys. I want you to have your experience with Jesus. You need to hear for yourself. You need to see for yourself that this is true, right? For, I mean, the best that this woman could do, right? She was just like, listen, I can't explain all of this, but let me tell you my story. And for some of us, that, that's maybe the best we got, and that's okay, right? You might not be able to like explain why Jesus came or answer everyone's questions when they're skeptics, but you might just, hey, I've encountered Jesus and my life has changed. And if that's all you can say, that's more than enough. All right, that, that for some people, right, they believe just because of what her story was. And for some of us, that's, that's what we have to share, right? Hey, I've encountered Jesus and I am now free as a result. My life has changed because I've met Jesus, right? And for some people, that'll be sufficient, right? Where they'll, they'll believe just on the basis of seeing God change your life because they knew what you were like before you met God. And for others, for the skeptics, that should be sufficient for them to investigate, to be like, okay, this person's completely different now. I've got to find out what caused this, right? I might not believe yet, but I've got to pursue this and figure out what's really going on here, right? What really happened to this person, right? And that's, that's what we end up seeing here is that, that some of them, right, they, they, they pursue Jesus and they hear him for themselves, right? And, and that's what I want for you. That's what God wants for us. He, he, he doesn't want us to believe just because like, well, my, my parents raised me this way, so they believe, so I believe. No, no, no. God wants you to believe because you've heard for yourself or you've searched the scriptures for yourself. That's what God wants. God wants you to have relationship with him, not like through someone else. Like, oh, whenever I have a God question, I'll just go and ask this person. No, no, no. God wants you to have that relationship with him. Right? So you need to see for yourself. And this is what they ended up saying. We have heard for ourselves and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. All right, that, that's the experience that I know that many of us are skeptical of. Like, I, I don't really know about that. But no, no, no. That's the experience that the Bible promises. That if you seek him, you will find him. I, I heard a preacher the other day say this, that one of the many reasons we believe the Bible is true, he said, the Bible promised an outcome, an experience, and that's exactly the experience that I got as a result of, of trying it out, of putting my faith in it, right? The Bible promised that it would resolve my sin issue, my guilt issue. It promised that I would be free from this, and that's the experience that I got, right? Like, like it, it didn't contradict itself in that process, right? So, so that's what we want. We want you to experience who Jesus is, right? That, that see for yourself. So let's see, back in Acts, verse 17, uh, chapter 17, verse 13, not everyone's happy about this again, but when the Jews from Thessalonica learned that God, the, the word of God was proclaimed by Paul at Berea also, they came there too, agitating and stirring up the crowds. So this was the people from the previous city from last week that Dan had preached about. Verse 14, then the brothers immediately sent Paul off on his way uh, to the sea, but Silas and Timothy remained there. And those who conducted or escorted Paul brought him as far as Athens, and after receiving a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him, as soon as possible, they departed. So... A bunch of people got upset that the word of God was going forth, right? Actually, these people were willing to travel from one village to the next because they were like, I think Paul and Silas, they escaped, right? I, I hear they went to this next town. I hear they're preaching about Jesus again. Let's go stop this. But these people were upset. They were offended at this, okay? And, and these, these people were religiously motivated, right? They, they in themselves, you know, they were just, you know, living by their worldview perhaps, they aren't specifically like the enemy, all right? Paul does say in Romans that he says this, as regards to the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, but as regards election, they are beloved, all right? So like people aren't the enemy, right? People might be offended at Jesus, but they are not our true enemy. They might be like upset that, that God's word is going forth, but they're not really what we're concerned with. We're concerned with loving them and bringing them to Jesus, but there is an enemy. 
There is a strategy. There is someone that's working against God's word going forth, someone that's opposed to God's kingdom, someone that's rebelled against God a long time ago. All right, so the true enemy is not the people. But what's interesting is that these people are working according to a strategy that has been Satan's strategy since the beginning. And that is that he gets upset when God's word is proclaimed as truth. Right, that, that even in the Garden of, of Eden with Eve, right, he said, did, did God really say that? Right, his objective is to cast doubt on God's word. Or Jesus in the four seed parable, I'll, I'll get to the second example that I'll do, two of the four. You can look up the other ones on your own time. But, uh, but Jesus actually tells us what the enemy's motive is when God's word goes forth, that he wants to take away the word. He wants to snatch away the word that, that hits our hearts. This is what, what Jesus said in, in Luke chapter 8, verse 12. He, Jesus says, the seed or the ones along the path all right, the, the seed that got put on the, the packed down earth are those who have heard. And then the devil comes and takes away the words from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. So what's interesting about this is one type of response to God's word, right? They have heard it, but they've rejected it for some reason, right? They didn't, they didn't believe it. Uh, Mark's gospel says that immediately Satan comes and takes away the word. Okay, that, that, that his objective, right, he, he, is to, he wants to cast doubt on God's word, on, on the truth. He wants to remove it from our hearts to, to not allow us to believe it. And so this is where he attacks, this is how he fights against God's kingdom moving forth. But what I think is interesting about this passage in Luke is that Jesus tells us what his motives are. Are. Right? We know his strategy. His strategy is to take away God's word. But his motive, it says in Luke, right, the why he does it is so that they may not believe and be saved. The reason Satan takes away the seed is so that they might not believe and be saved. And what's interesting here is that the enemy knows that God's word in our hearts produces belief. And that belief brings us to salvation. That's what the, the enemy knows. That, did, did you know that Satan had such a strong understanding of the gospel? Did you know that Satan knew and knows what God's word produces in our hearts? Right? His whole battle strategy is based on, on that. That he knows this is how he can attack us. Right? He doesn't want us to believe to the point of salvation. So, this is an interesting question. Do we believe what Satan believes about God's word? Right, that sounds really weird. You're like, I don't know that. No? Like, but no, do we believe what Satan believes about God's word? I know he doesn't like it. He knows that it's true. But do we recognize how powerful it is at changing lives? Because he knows how powerful it is. He knows what it can do. That his whole strategy is, is to attack it. Do we hold God's word to the same value that the enemy does? Do we recognize that that's his primary place of attack? Do we cherish and protect the thing that our enemy recognizes as, as an extremely value, valuable resource? Do we realize that? Because the word is the thing that produces belief. And that belief leads to salvation. Paul said this in Romans 1, Verse 16, he says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Right? To the Jew first and also to the Greek. So, so the gospel, God's word going forth, is what produces belief and that belief, salvation. The enemy knows that, but do we live as though that's true? That's the means by which people are saved. Right? I, I want to point out that, that, yeah, we should love our neighbor, but loving our neighbor doesn't produce salvation in someone. All right? that, that's, just like, that's just putting frosting on it. Right? That's just trying to make God's word appealing to other people, trying to convey it in a way that they want to seek it out. Right? We are to do good works. Jesus said if you do good works, right, they'll see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. But that, that alone, us being good, doesn't result in people being saved. 
What results in people being saved is God's word being proclaimed, the truth of God being shared, right? So I, I, I do know that we need to be loving, right? We need to do good to others. But the thing that produces change is, is the truth of God's word. Pa- Paul says this in Romans 10. I don't have it on the screen. He says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, right, that he's God, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Right? It, it's, it's about that belief that produces salvation. And the word is the thing that does that. It says this in verse 13 in Romans 10. For everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Then check out this problem. He gives a a list of rhetorical questions. How then will they call on him if they have not believed? And how will they believe in him if they have not heard? And how will they hear without someone preaching or proclaiming it? It doesn't mean just preachers, right? It means us sharing God's word with them. And how are they to preach unless they are sent? So the idea is that God's word is the thing that produces change in our hearts. God's word is the thing that produces belief in us to the point of being saved. And God wants that word to go forth and the enemy wants to remove it. So I want to make sure that we're actually, right, sharing Jesus with other people, right? Sometimes, right, we strategize, we got to be, right, sometimes slow on the uptake. We don't want to just like, ah, you need this, right? It's hard to do that because we're like, I really want you to know this, right? We get excited, but, but we need to make sure we're actually sharing the gospel with other people because without the gospel, that they're missing out, right? This is the message that we have, that God's given us all the ministry of reconciliation, letting people know that God's not counting their sins against them, right? Just in case we're confused on what the gospel is, it's just this general message of hope from the Bible, but it does start out with some bad news, and that is one that there is a judgment, that we are all held accountable for our sin, that we are all guilty. It's not like Christians are somehow better than other people. It's just that we're forgiven. And that God has made a way to make forgiveness available for us, right? That Jesus, God in the flesh, God among us, came down to live a perfect life and to pay the penalty for my crimes and yours. And that through him, we can have forgiveness, relationship with God, and eternal life is what he says. Right, that we can be free from sin. So it's, that's the message of hope. Right? We don't, we're not just telling people, hey, have you thought about being a good person? Or like, you know, have you thought about being more loving to people? Like, that, that doesn't produce change. The gospel bring, doesn't make bad people good. It, it makes dead people alive. Right? That it brings us to spiritual life on the inside. That's what the gospel does. Let's, let's have the, the worship team come up here. I've got one more verse up here because... I've, I've, I've emphasized the importance of God's word, but we, we don't worship the Bible, okay? Right? We're not like, like the Bible isn't the thing that makes us saved. The Bible is just the, the message that produces that belief. Okay, this is what, this is what Jesus said in John chapter 5, because he, he encountered people all the time who, who studied the Bible, but they missed out on this tremendous relationship that they could have with God. Right? I don't want to just like preach about the importance of God's word and then you'd be like, all right, I'm just going to like have a Bible with me when I drive and it'll be like a good luck charm and I can rub it and like God will keep me safe. Like, no, no, no. Our hope isn't in like a book. All right. The book points to who our hope is in. This is what Jesus said in John 5. He says, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And I am encouraging you today, right? Search the scriptures. See for yourself. But this is what he says, and it is they that bear witness about me, right, about Jesus. So the purpose of God's word is to point us to Jesus. In verse 40, yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. All right, so it's not the word of God itself that we worship. We worship Jesus, who I guess John chapter 1 does describe Jesus as the word, okay, but But the idea is that we need to have a relationship with Jesus. Don't just be like, I'm going to just study my Bible and that's it. Or I'm going to listen to sermons and that's it. No. Seek out Jesus. Have a relationship with him. Don't don't refuse him in exchange for some like intellectualism or like do-goodism that you get from the Bible. Like, or I'll just try to be a good person. No, no, no. We need Jesus. We need to be forgiven for 
our sin. So I'll pray real quick to wrap this up. But during these last, this last song, there's only one song. Make your heart right with God, right? If you've never put your hope in Jesus, if you've never called upon the name of the Lord to be saved, like it said in Romans, right? You can do that right now, right? Don't just like know the Bible, believe the Bible, do something with it. Don't refuse Jesus, accept him as your savior. And, and because of that relationship, right? We, we have communion today. Right, the juice, it's just juice, we don't do wine here. Uh, the juice represents the blood that he shed that we could be forgiven. And the bread represents his broken body that we could be fully healed, that we could have new bodies one day. Right, so, so it's, that's something we do thanking him and, and just thinking about what he's done for us. So that's something that we can do at the, the end of the song, just get up when your heart's ready and you just grab that and take communion wherever you'd like. Let's, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much, God, that you love us abundantly, but it is, it is not just simply your love that we rest in. I thank you for your kindness towards us and your forgiveness, but, but that forgiveness is only available through belief and, and repentance, that we have to turn from our old lives and pursue you, God. I ask that you would just be at work in our hearts right now, that you would point out the things that we need to repent of, the things we should apologize for, and that God, in exchange, that instead of just putting that down, that we would pursue you, that we need you as a savior. It's not enough for me to just be sorry that I've done wrong. I need to trust in you to forgive me. I need to call you Lord. So I ask that you would just be at work in our hearts, that, that God, even today, there would be those here that would call upon your name for the first time and experience salvation, that they would be able to take part in communion, maybe for the first time ever truly having believed in you and being saved. And God, I thank you that we get to worship you, that we get to enjoy your presence, that we get to enjoy eternity with you, and that, Lord, because you so loved us, that you, that you so died for us, that we now go out and share this message of hope with other people, that we study the scriptures for ourselves to know that this truth is a certainty that we can rely on, that our hope is in you, that we don't need to doubt, we don't need to have condemnation for our sin, but we are fully forgiven, we are confident in you. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen.